Today we'll be talking to Bernie supporters on what they think about his partnership with Donald Trump. And I'm sitting down with the Vice President of Graduate Student Government to find out why there are new banners on campus. And we'll be talking everything else politics, so stay with us. The Current is next. I look forward to working with Mr. Trump to tell corporate America, you know what? You cannot keep running all over the world, whether it's China or Vietnam or God knows where, searching for the cheapest possible labor while you destroy the middle class and working class of this country. Hello and welcome to The Current. The election may be over, but the former candidates are still dominating the news cycle. You just heard from Senator Bernie Sanders suggesting the Democrats and Donald Trump may be able to find common ground. Earlier this morning, Bernie Sanders spoke at a Christian Science Monitor-sponsored breakfast. He talked about a wide range of topics, but what, ca what caught our attention was what you just heard President-elect Donald Trump may find himself an unlikely ally in Bernie Sanders. Eric Lee and I are joined by two former Bernie Sanders supporters here in the Media Center to talk about what we can expect from Bernie Sanders moving forward. Joey and Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Our pleasure. So, what do you guys think about what Bernie said earlier about finding a common ground between Donald Trump? You know, um, I have to say that although I feel there's probably not going to be that much that they'll be able to find common ground on, Anything that, like Bernie said uh, earlier this week, if there's anything that Donald, Mr. Donald Trump is able to do to help the American people, that Bernie will be all in favor for it. And that's how it should be. You know, we should remember that if it benefits the American people and it's truly going to bring about progressive change, by all means, it's a great thing that um, they'll be able to work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think something that Bernie's recognized um, throughout the whole campaign was that the political polarization in this country right now is ridiculously high. And if you can do anything you can to um, try to decrease that and try to reach across the aisle to the other side and not dehumanize them, but view them as people who also want to make the world a better place, but just mm -hmm. have their own methods of doing that, then why, how should we not? Like, it's his, it's his duty to, um, to make sure that we can try to come together again and you know, make, a, make an impact. And, yeah. <laughs> right. I, you guys have been Bernie supporters for a while. So Absolutely. where does the political movement that Bernie started go from here? You know, that's a good question because a lot of people have been wondering the exact same thing. You know, now that Bernie is out, now that we have President like Trump, how do we channel this energy that the progressive movement mm -hmm. has created? Right. And, you know, here in Los Angeles specifically, we have a lot of former Bernie supporters, f Bernie activists who are planning to continue the progressive movement through talking mm -hmm. about the issues, informing the people about what's going on um, with the political climate. I mean, we have a lot of voter education. You know, a lot of people are doing voter registration. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are encouraging um, to lobby your, your senator, your representative, and that's how the way we bring about change. And of course, just informing people about the important issues that, you know, if President-elect Trump decides to institute a registry for our Muslim brothers and sisters, how do we respond to that? Do we you know, everyone register, crash the system. How do we show solidarity with right. Standing Rock uh, out in North Dakota and protect the environmental rights and indigenous rights, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's really how it goes from here, by involving people with the issues that matter to them and informing them and empowering them to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's important to make sure that we are also focusing on nonprofits and um, non-governmental organizations because worst case scenario, something like the EPA gets defunded. We can still do so much on our own to make sure that um, people are doing what they can as individuals to not, not contribute to climate change, um, to not support uh, non or unenvironmental corporations, and uh, to make sure people are educated about the dangers that face our country. Mm -hmm. So speaking of individual impact, did you guys vote for Hillary Clinton or 
So uh, personally, I could not bring myself to vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, a lot of the problems that the Bernie Sanders campaign addressed about the Hillary campaign, you know, just because um, Bernie lost the nomination doesn't mean that Hillary's problems still went away. She still helped out a coup in Honduras. She still supported a no-fly zone in, Zir in Syria. She still didn't support 100% tuition-free public college and university. So for all, all those reasons and more, I personally couldn't bring myself to vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, I voted for Jill Stein of the Green Party. Um, and do yeah. you think voting third party helped Trump win? You know, I don't think so at all. I mean, here in California, argue what you may, but my vote for Jill Stein, you know, ultimately California is a blue state. It went to Hillary, so it had pretty much zero impact on the Electoral College. Nationwide, Jill Stein made up less than 1% of the votes, and statistics show that even mm -hmm. if all her votes got added on to Hillary's to total, it wouldn't have changed the impact. And as for Gary Johnson, you know, you can say what you will. He did get large margins, but look at the Johnson supporters. They're more ideologically right. aligned with Trump. If anything, they took votes away from Donald Trump. Right. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Uh, back to you, Hannah. Thanks, Sophie and Erica. Well, millions of people get their news from social media, but not all news on social media is real. Earlier today, President Obama weighed in on the problem, saying that fake news poses a threat to democracy. An investigation by BuzzFeed showed that the top fake news stories in the months leading up to the election got more engagement than the new, the face on Facebook than the top stories from credible news organizations. I would say that like a lot of like those trending Facebook buzz things is where I get like my immediate like news notifications. Facebook, I feel like I don't really trust Facebook in terms of like media sources. I feel like sometimes like I don't know like. Sometimes people share it or like, I don't know if it's like a blog instead of like a news source. During the election, I noticed a lot of media bias with the New York Times and the Washington Post. So I actually stopped reading those news articles. So now I use Bing. Bing is my news source. <laughs> I mean, like the, the value of like those Facebook trending little places, like you can see them and you can see what's trending, but you can also find like a CNN article there. Sometimes people are like, oh, like, only if it were true. And then I'm like, oh, it's not true. Like, you know, how do they know that? Because, like, I'm sharing it, but um, it seems like it's legit. With fake news all over the internet and social media, we wanted to see if students could tell the difference between fictional headlines and real ones. I looked at some of the most shared headlines from real news sources and phony ones and learned how hard it can be to spot the fakes. Is this headline real or fake? Breaking. Trump fires 500 Obama staffers. Dems panic. Real or fake? Real. Fake. Oh, really? <laughs> Just read the law. Hillary is disqualified from holding any federal office. Real. Fake. One week after election, Chelsea caught in massive criminal scheme. Real or fake? Real. Fake. <laughs> First steps. Donald Trump has to go around the White House's neighborhood letting residents know he's moving in down the street. Real or fake? Fake. Right. <laughs> it's over. Hillary's ISIS email just leaked and it's worse than anyone could have imagined. Um, I'm gonna say real. It's fake. Melania Trump's girl-on-girl -girl photos from Racy Shoot revealed. Real or fake? Fake. Real. What? I ran the CIA, now I'm endorsing Hillary Clinton. Real or fake? Real. You're right. Stop pretending you don't know why people hate Hillary Clinton. Fake. Real. Trump caught on tape admitting the real reason he ran for president. Voters furious. Real or fake? Real. Fake. Melania Trump's girl-on-girl -girl photos from Racy Shoot revealed. True. Oh, real. Possible voter suppression. Lots of laser tag places are still open today. Fake. You're right. Like, <laughs> wait a second. The explosion of fake news brings up the question of the role of journalism. Annenberg Media's Jake Gracia has an analysis of the media's coverage during Trump's campaign and how to move forward reporting on Trump's presidency. Sophie, Donald Trump's win caught many by surprise, including much of the mainstream media. I spoke with journalism professors and political analysts to understand how news organizations covered Trump's campaign and how the media needs to adapt during his presidency. The election that shocked America. How the f did we get here, and what the f do we do now? And the candidate. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh, that shook up traditional journalism. From reality TV star to presidency, this is a creature of television. Experts say the media's fixation on Donald Trump helped propel him to the White House. 
because he was so unique and such a different kind of candidate that a lot of the outlets, especially cable television, didn't really take him seriously, but they thought he was great ratings. A network executive this. admitting like exactly life. that. It may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. That's all I got to say. <laughs> the money's rolling in, and uh, this is fun. It's a terrible thing to say, but uh, bring it on, Donald. Go ahead. Keep going. Billions of dollars estimated in free coverage. It brought viewers. It drove revenue. And so media companies that are interested in making money uh, uh, wanted to cover Trump. And CNN President Jeff Zucker acknowledged it was too much. Uh, we probably did put on too many of his uh, campaign rallies in, the, in those early months, uh, un, you know, unedited and, and just let them run. There was an attraction to put those on the air. And I think in hindsight, we probably shouldn't have done that as much. Donald Trump contributing to a post-truth society, what Oxford Dictionary just named its word of the year post-truth, the post-truth culture, which is where we are now. Facts don't matter he, to him and his followers and to a lot of people. So what I hope is, is journalists will realize it's not enough just to say what the facts are, but to say what those facts mean, how that would affect governing, how that would affect political policy. And with Trump continuing to hammer the news media as corrupt. He will continue to use social media to go around the mainstream media if he doesn't like what they're writing. Journalists must adjust. If they're not following fact-checking sources or don't care about them because it feels good to have your bias affirmed, that is a very scary, scary thing. And I think we have to keep pounding away at it, whether p people want to read it or not. Now those experts I spoke with say a crucial element of journalism going forward, news literacy, those critical thinking skills necessary to understanding where your news is coming from and if what you're getting is really factual. They say it's a daunting time to be a journalist, but Donald Trump's presidency brings the opportunity for some of the most important journalism of our time. You know, that part about post-truth era is really terrifying to me. I mean, does that just mean we don't care about facts and science and data anymore? It just means that so many people are reading so many of their own news sources. You're, they're in an echo chamber of their own biases, and they just hear what they want to hear, and they don't get, ever get the actual facts. Weird. Very weird. So, obviously, the media was very heavily criticized for how they reported and covered Trump. Um, going forward, how do you think we will cover political candidates, mm. whether they're from the established or an outsider like Trump was? It's going to be so important going forward to not back down, to continue to produce strong journalism, ask important questions, and really just do the best that we can. Mm -hmm. Since Trump's election, there have been multiple protests against him across the country, in Los Angeles and right here at USC. We wanted to know how Trump supporters here on campus are reacting to his surprise victory. Annenberg Media's Lauren Day sat down with two Trump supporters to hear their thoughts about the president-elect. I got like 20 calls that night. Wow. You must be so happy. I, by the way, I liked him too all this time, and I just didn't want to tell you, or I was embarrassed, or mm. I, I didn't want to get the hate. You know, we've seen a bunch of people have saying racist incidents that have happened mm -hmm. since he won the election. Yeah. As a Trump supporter, <clears throat> what do you think about that? How does it make you feel when you hear about those incidents? I'm comple completely against him, obviously. He did get out there and said, you know what, stop it. So we'll see what mm -hmm. happens. Um, I, I'm not, a, not for that. Um, it's time to bring the nation together, whether you like it or not. Uh, and many other things they are protesting is due to the lies that the media has spawned in the last months that created this idea that Trump is a horrible person. He's already kind of stepped back on a lot of his immigration issues that it is. He's like, there won't be a wall everywhere, I heard. There could be just a fence. Like, I'm okay with that. The guy got elected saying, as much as I want a wall and everything, I realize that he's going to meet in the middle with a bunch of, of Democrats, and that's fine. Let's meet in the middle, unify this this nation and um, just work things out, which I think he's uh, going to do. Some of the strongest criticism of Trump since the election centers on his choice of Steen, Steve Bannon as chief strategist. Bannon is a controversial figure and has been linked to the so-called alt-right. Our reporter Razan Naklawi put together this explanation of the origins of the alt-right movement. The 
right wing has not been cool for a while. And the, I guess the benefit or the draw of the alt-right is that it actually seems like it's something cool to be involved in. But they, there's a culture and they've gotten really good at just bothering people. If you walk down Truesdale today, you may have noticed black colored banners hanging from the lampposts. This morning, some of the banners were switched out to support Black Lives Matter. The new banners were sponsored by the undergraduate student government, graduate student government, and different cultural centers on campus. We asked students their thoughts on the new banners. I think it's something that needs to be addressed on campus. I mean, it's something that we don't want to talk about, or especially the university kind of puts under the rug. So I'm glad that they're at least doing something about it. But I mean, these are just first steps. I mean, they're not really a solution. To be honest, I was a little bit surprised. Um, this is a very bold kind of move, and I didn't think the university would be, I guess, down for this. But um, I'm really happy that it's up there. Visually seeing something, it's a constant reminder to people so they can be aware of what's happening. It's on saying that these other lives matter. It's on saying that Asian lives don't matter or blue lives don't matter or white lives don't matter. I think it's just right now in this moment of um, hostility between blacks and the police, it's saying that black lives matter. So I'm joined right now by grad with graduate student government vice president Chris Coombs. Chris, you were the person who brought these banners to campus. Thank you so much again for being here. Of course, no problem. And, you know, where did this idea come for for these banners? Sure. So I first heard of the idea um, actually in a news article that was reporting about uh, a flag that had been raised at the University of Vermont. Their undergraduate student government there had voted to raise the flag, and there's a whole history behind that flag. Um, being used to support various other causes. Um, and so I thought, this was back in September sometime, and I thought it would be a good idea to bring that here to USC, given the provost um, statement that was released at the end of last April and a lot of the um, movement that the university has been doing towards trying to improve its diversity, access, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Right, so you mentioned some of this, or hinted at some of this, but you know, the Black Lives Matter mo Matters movement was started in 2013. Why now? Like, is there any reason that we should be doing this now, putting up these banners, you know, re or continuing this dialogue on campus? Sure, well, I think during the election campaign, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, in the primaries, they've been pushing really hard. They've been trying to speak with uh, different candidates, reaching out to them. But over time, they, were le they became less and less visible. And it's still a very relevant movement to what's going on in the world today. A lot of the things that they fight for are really for sort of a general, broad-based sense of justice and equality. You know, you want you know, equal housing, education, transportation, access to food and resources, political power. These are all things that a large swath of the American population actually does want, regardless of gender, sexuality, sexual orientation, race, income level, what have you. And so we wanted to show our support for um, the Black Lives Matter movement sort of as a general whole in that the student representatives here at USC are fighting for all of these historically marginalized groups and we want to make sure that they know that they're on our agenda. So with the election, uh, this has kind of given voice to or just amplified the alt-right movement, um, which viewers heard about earlier. You know, there have been some incidents on campus where people have been discriminated against. What do you think adds to this conversation? Just kind of elaborating on your last um, thoughts. Sure. So I think the first thing is that um, we had planned the, the installation of the banners far before even the election happened. You know, the university policy had like a whole five, six week timeline. So I think the recent events that happened on campus actually just sort of revalidated um, the need to remind campus that like, you know, black lives do matter. We had incidents of students who 
immediately after the election having, you know, referred to with the N-word. And, like, that's, that's a really serious offense. And so we wanted to make sure both the graduate student government and the undergraduate student government um, wanted to make sure that all students like knew that we took those issues seriously. You know, whenever we're in a trustee meeting or a board meeting or we're meeting with the provost, the president, we're bringing up these issues of why the campus climate here sometimes feels so alienating for so many students of color. Um, I think these banners are just a really, really small step in showing that we do care and we want to make sure that they feel validated and supported and that they can always come to us. Yeah, definitely, and that's so important, especially we tout this idea of a Trojan family, right. and you know, <laughs> do we live up to that all the time? Um, do you think that these banners, like, cause, while some people feel included, you know, some people might feel alien because maybe they don't understand the movement or they've heard a lot about the movement, but you know, they just don't know all of the details behind it. Have you heard any criticism from um, students? So both, USG and GSU, we went through you know, our own internal formal processes. We brought it to first our executive boards and then to our senates and you know, to our the larger bodies for a vote. And there were some students who expressed some concern or they weren't totally in alignment or agreement with it. And we actually did listen to those concerns and we heard them and we want to make sure that all of the programming that we do next semester does address those concerns. You know, some people feel like when we say Black Lives Matter or Trans Lives Matter, it's full stop, no one else matters. And what we want to emphasize is that it's saying that Black Lives Matter too. Historically, they have not. And we can look at countless, countless sociological studies to prove this. So for us, it's, we want to make sure that those people know that we understand where they're coming from, but we want to sort of change the conversation and say, okay, this isn't just about us trying to say, you're unimportant. This is about saying, we matter as well. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Comment below your thoughts on the banners. Um, if you, you're critical or if you're in support, we'd really like to know. Thank you. This election was long and hard fought. Now that it's over, tensions in America are high. Joe Biden may be on his way out of office, but Biden memes are taking over the internet and giving America a much needed laugh. I think my favorite one is is where he says, "I now that I've signed these forms, you and Michelle are my are my parents." I think, I think I'd like to be their child as well. <laughs> I think there are just so many great gems that have like come through, and it's on both sides too. Like definitely, I've been sharing with one of our political directors like memes back and forth whenever we see them. Like some people, you know, Melania, like you said, Michelle. People are putting like, "Oh, there's one that says." an immigrant's taking my job. Like, it's on both sides, and I think it's so fascinating, this political era, yes. digital age. Yes, it's definitely the perfect time for memes. Well, thanks for watching The Current. From everyone at Annenberg Media, I'm Sophie Flay. And I'm Hannah Vega. You can join us on, or watch us on the web at uscannenbergmedia.com or on our USC Annenberg Media Facebook page. Good night.